Hello and welcome to yet another great podcast that we have to offer you today. And we're honored as always to have Bill Holter on with us. This is his third time joining us and we're honored to have him. As you know, Bill is a broker of over 23 years. He's got several decades of financial experience, particularly in the concentration of precious metals. And he is a broker working currently with um, different channels, especially Miles Franklin. And he has his own website that you can access him for consulting, billholter.com. And he's been kind enough, to, kind enough to join us once again. Bill, thanks for uh, once again being on our podcast. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me back. Definitely. Okay, so Bill, we're going to hit it right out of the park uh, quickly with some, some out of the gate questions um, because I because I know you know what's going on. So we recently have had seen gold experience all time highs at twenty one forty seven, and it seems to be rising. The question I have for you is, um, what do you see as its next milestone, and is there anything that can prevent it at this point from going forward? I don't know. Uh, as far as a milestone, I mean, we're we are at all time highs right now at twenty one sixty. Um, it's a breakout, and I guess the question is, uh, how far is the run? And there's no way to know. Um, as a matter of fact, I just posted, uh, and it should be up, I posted it this morning, uh, gold and silver prices in Reich marks from 1919 to 1923. And gold went from 170 Reich marks in 1919 to 87 trillion Reich marks in 1923. Um, silver, I think, was 584 uh, billion Reich marks. The reason I'm bringing this up is because gold and, and those those ounces back in 1923 are the same ounce 100 years later. What's different is the currency. And I'm, I'm bringing this up uh, the latest currency to blow up was the uh, Egyptian pound. It devalued that last night, 60%. And of course, gold, silver, a cup of coffee, uh, a stick of chewing gum, you name it, anything real, just cost more than, it's 100% more in Egyptian pounds this morning than it was yesterday. Wow. I mean, that sounds like a lot like Lebanon a couple of years ago when they devalued 90%. So uh, it's a pretty significant uh, point that you're making. Um, so we see the, uh, the last week here, Bill, we saw, of course, the usual players, Bezos and Zuckerberg and um, Elon Musk and, and, of course, Jamie Dimon, which I thought was pretty significant, selling off uh, billions of shares uh, combined. And with all that naked shortage going on, what do you think that does to the stock market? That's not naked shorting, that's insider selling. And of course, when an insider sells, they've got to report it. Uh, what it tells me is they're freeing up cash to do other things with it. They're freeing up cash so that they're not as heavily concentrated. Uh, I think it was a week or two weeks ago, uh, there was a story out that Mark Zuckerberg is building I don't know if he's he's built it already or if it's still in progress, but building a hundred and twenty uh, million dollar, basically survival bunker, and I mean if they're doing things like that, you can bet that they're buying gold and that they're buying silver, and I'm sure they're buying Bitcoin. Um, you know, when all is said and done, it's my opinion Bitcoin is digital air. It's it's not going to be a it won't work as a wealth transfer, but that remains to be seen. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so you see that uh, Jerome Powell is now hinting at the first Fed rate cut by June. Um, do you believe that when that first cut happens, let's say it is June, do you think that signals officially that the wheels are coming off of the old economy as we knew it? Um, <laughs> Well, we had the, what was it, the New York uh, Community Bank yesterday. Mm -hmm. they, they were collapsing. Uh, Mnuchin put a billion dollars into it, and now it's back to where it was the day before, still down 80% for the year. Uh, the banking problem is not over with. And 
the Fed, uh, I mean, if there are obviously, if there's a, a bank that goes under or whatever, or any type of stress, the Fed's going to cut rates. It's my opinion that ultimately the Fed, the Fed has already lost control of the entire game. But I, I do, I believe that the Fed at some point is going to be forced to raise rates. Um, they're going to be forced to raise rates to protect the dollar, support the dollar. Uh, if they don't do that, and and they just go straight through with the with easing rates and much lower rates, you're going to see the dollar tank, unlike ever before. And when I say tank, uh, not just versus real goods, but tank versus foreign currencies. And the mm. problem is that the the uh, the dollar is the world's reserve currency. You've got all these central banks that have big percentages, 50, 60, 70% of their reserves are in dollars. And if you have a dollar that's it's collapsing, uh, you know, and smoke coming out of the wheelhouse, the problem there is now you're affecting other central banks, other central banks' balance sheets are going to go upside down. And talking about upside down, all of these central banks are technically insolvent now. Because interest rates had, had risen, they, they had purchased so many of the bad bonds back from 2008, 2009 uh, to, to save the system. They're still sitting on, on those and they're sitting on new bonds that they purchased. And when rates went up this past year, year and a half, the bond prices went down. And what it did was they went down so far and the, and the central banks had so many of these bonds it basically wiped out the capital of all central banks. So you've got a you've got a system that's running on not even a, a the head of a needle. You've got a system that's running on nothing because, like I said, they're technically insolvent, which means they've got negative equity. Hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up. Thank you. I'm glad you brought up the New York Community Bank because that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. You know, they've I think they've lost as of yesterday forty percent over 3 billion in company losses. And I, I remember in the last couple of shows, you've made a, a really strident point about the fact that it really doesn't matter which bank goes down because they're all in bed together and it'll be a three-day domino effect ostensibly. Um, but with that being right. said, would it be reasonably fair to say that looking at the New York Community Bank as an example, since you brought up, is a, um, a checkpoint of things to come for other banks possibly? Yeah, it's a checkpoint of things to come. Uh, I, I think, and I haven't really looked into it, but I think one of their bigger problems uh, is the loan portfolio itself. Uh, and also they're going to need to raise capital to meet the Basel III requirements. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they're that big in derivatives. I've not looked into it, so I can't say definitively. Uh, so, I mean, they could go down and the it would wobble the system. But if you had a if you had a bank that is significant in derivatives that were to go down, then you're impairing derivatives. And that's a $2 quadrillion market, which is, call it 20 times the size of the global economy. Wow. It's pretty sobering. Um, so I'm glad you brought up foreign currencies, specifically the Egyptian pound, because that was another question I want to ask you, Bill, with uh, BRICS, as you know, gaining uh, an ever-present foothold. Nigeria today has announced that they're considering joining the BRICS, which I think we know means they will be, because uh, we know Zimbabwe is coming in. Um, with, with BRICS gaining a foothold uh, on the economy in terms of GDP and overall foot presence on the world, um, they've just asked Iraq to join, and Iraq is also working on joining the WTO. Uh, what message does that send to you, Bill, if all about in terms of the new uh, BRICS system becoming the new preeminent leader of the global economy in the future? Well, the the more members they garner, the the bigger they are, more GDP is aligned with the BRICS as opposed to the West. I think the important thing, though, is once the BRICS does uh, introduce a new currency. When they introduce a new currency, it will be backed by something. And, you know, they've talked about uh, various commodities and, of course, they've talked about gold. Were they to 
announce a new currency that's backed by gold that basically would smoke the entire uh, Western financial system because then you would see a huge run into gold and obviously it would, you know, it, it would affect, you'd have silver and gold running really hard and the shorts in those markets would blow up and then you'd have a domino effect within the uh, derivatives market. So do you think it's a case, Bill, of quantity of members or the quality of members, like having Saudi Arabian people, UAE people that, do you think, or do you think it's a little bit of both perhaps? Um, I think there's already enough members in there to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, just Russia and China themselves, if they aligned and they said, you know, we are going to trade between ourselves with this new currency and we'll offer it to other nations that want to use the currency, that would be enough on its own. So I don't think they need any more members uh, when you say quantity versus quality. The quality aspect is, uh, I mean, I would just say that that's basically China and Russia because they are, yeah. uh, you know, the two biggest members, the two most important members. And, you know, if they put their brains together and came up with a, if they were to come up with a currency just between the two of them, that would be enough to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you, uh, especially uh, precipitating the need that, that Russia and especially China has economically, they really, they need this transition, this reset to happen. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, pivoting a little bit, Bill, on some other matters. So with the obvious rise of President Trump gaining momentum and winning in the primaries on a nationwide scale, I think he won everybody but Vermont this week, go figure. Um, do you think there's going to be an election in November or do you see something, a different scenario in, happening entirely? Um, I think I even said this on your show um, once before, but I'm on the record now that I think there's less than a 50-50 chance that we actually have an election. And my reasoning behind that is it does look like, uh, I mean, Biden is failing. He can't yeah. speak in public. Uh, I can't even, I can't imagine a debate between the two of them. And I mean, just look at the poll numbers. You know, Trump is now leading nationwide and it looks like a total landslide in the electoral college. Mm -hmm. If, if, that is the case and it continues that way going forward i think those that are in power are going to realize they can't they won't be able to cheat enough to win and if they can't win and they lose power many of the past misdeeds that have been uh covered up looked away from whatever they're going to come forward and people are going to go to jail so i don't see the left giving up power I, and I think their reaction will be some type of event, false flag, real, whatever, some type of event that would prevent, that they could say, oh, no, we can't have an election. I mean, they've already done that in Ukraine. The election that was supposed to be in, in I think it's May, April or May, they've already, that's already been canceled because they're at war. Right. Right. I mean, I'm sort of surprised, to be honest with you, that they're having a State of the Union tonight, given all that you said. That's still somewhat surprising. With two intermissions. With two intermissions. <laughs> yeah, there's supposedly there's going to be two intermissions. Um, wow. I, I don't know for a fact, but I don't think ever has there been an intermission in a State of the Union address. And you got to ask why. Why is there an inter intermission? Because guy probably needs to use the bathroom and, and, you know, get shot up again so he can speak for another 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe bring in another stand in, you know, you never know. It's uh, if there's so whatever. many, I mean, who knows? yeah, whatever. Yeah, right. exactly. Exactly. So um, thank you for that. Um, with the death of the queen of England and now, especially the Rothschild death, uh, that seemed like a pretty significant death blow to the deep state banking system. Would you agree or do you have a different opinion on that? Um, I don't think it matters. Really? I don't think it matters one way or the other. Uh, I mean, as far as the queen, uh, I mean, King Charles, but now obviously now he's got some type of cancer or some type of problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, he's going to change policy. 
will Rothschild's heirs change policy? I don't think so. I I think uh, you know their plans go on as normal, no matter who dies. Okay, fair enough. Now, now that that being said, I do believe that there are many many events that are unraveling. Um, you know, many narratives. DEI, I mean, the whole woke uh, thought process is unraveling because the average person is looking at it. The, the lies have gotten so big and so grand that even the average person can see through them. I just I think there's there's too many things now that are unraveling. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's going to lead to. Uh, I don't even know how to word this. It's going to lead to the tr the truth coming out, and you're going to have a lot of really uh, pissed off people, but a lot of disillusioned people that are going to find out that the life that they've been living for you know years and years has been a lie. And I mean, obviously, one of the biggest lies is that people work, they get paid in dollars, they get paid in euros, they get paid in yen get paid in British pounds, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, whatever. They, they've worked their entire lives and they've saved and they've done the things they were told they were supposed to do. And I mean, the, the biggest lie they're going to find out they worked for nothing, that their savings are going to be gone. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right because uh, I have some family members fall right into that equation. I'm sure you, you probably know some as well. It kind of alludes to what you talked about, Bill, in our last show about, you know, people going to get their 401ks and their pensions and think, well, I've got mine, I'm good. And then they're going to wake up the next, you know, after the weekend and everything catastrophically changes to your, to your point. Um, so that actually pivots, Bill, to another question I had for you. Uh, it seems like more, because you're talking about the evidence coming out, it seems like more evidence is coming out every day that the, what was deemed to be conspiratorial theories are actually playing themselves out whether that's, you know, UFOs to the Kennedy assassination to 9-11, all that stuff. Um, what, what do you think, Bill? Do you believe uh, that the Titanic was uh, actually sunk by businessman Jacob Astor and other individualists to prevent, the, uh, to, to, could not prevent the creation of the central bank uh, as far as COVID and all those things? What is your take on some of these matters? Uh, the only thing I can say is that, uh we're running out of conspiracy theories because mm. the bulk of them have already been proven. Yeah. I mean, here we are, here we are uh, three years after the vaccine came out and you've got a congressman that is trying to put a bill forward where the liability of the, the vaccine companies is taken away because, you know, what they said, safe and effective, blah, blah, blah. It was all bullshit. Mm -hmm. And people know that. I mean, there's obviously some people still with their head in the sand. And I mean, most 99% of those people are ones that have been vaccinated. And it's mm -hmm. easier it's easier to lie to someone than to convince someone that they've been lied to. So right. you're going to always have some people with their heads in the sand. But you've also got people that have lost loved ones. Uh, you've got people that... You've got people that are... are you know, have skin in the game and have been affected, their lives have been affected. I just think you're going to have, have a mass uproar, uprising, whatever you want to call it. And it, it will spread. And it's not just COVID. I mean, it's all, it's all sorts of things. Um, I mean, if you talked about the election being rigged, you know, you're, you're a conspir conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they've done movies on that showing the showing them the, the 2000 mules, uh, you know, for years and years and years, if you said, you know, 9-11, there's no way planes could take, take buildings down. You know, you were shouted down and called an idiot. Well, uh, University of Alaska did a story and you can find it if you dig, you, but you really have to dig for it mm -hmm. on building seven. And that came out a year and a half ago. Um, and these were engineers that did the study. And these engineers concluded that there's absolutely no way the official narrative could have happened. And it's, I mean, just go, 
go narrative after narrative after narrative, mm -hmm. they're all breaking down. And that's what I was alluding to when I said, you know, two, there, there's, there's threads being pulled on all of these narratives because they don't make sense. They never did make sense. But the initial reaction was to shout people down, call them idiots, call them conspiracy theorists. But like I said, the, a, a huge bulk of conspiracy theories have already been proven to be conspiracy fact. Exactly. That's why, that's why I was asking a question, because it goes back to what you were just saying a minute ago, that people are going to wake up angry and disillusioned that what they thought was the truth was a lie and vice versa. It's going to be a complete juxtaposition of everything that we've ever lived, how we've lived, and especially when it comes to the financial system. Um, let me just say this. Sure. The, the people that have their heads in the sand, they're, they're going to pull their heads out of the sand and they'll have full understanding the day that they wake up and their wealth has been stripped from them. But the question becomes how long between that time and everything that happens, you know, it's going to be kind of a, a, a wing it scenario, right? Where they're going to kind of be learning as they go, basically. Oh, I think it'll be immediate. Yeah. I mean, if, if you woke up on a Monday morning and markets had a problem opening and had the same problem the next day, and then the third day you've got markets all over the world closing down by Thursday or Friday, you're, you're going to have the average person understanding that, you know, they've lost their wealth and the, the syndrome of not in my backyard is right in their face because mm -hmm. it happened. now it's happened to them. So then people, and only then will the vast, vast majority of people be open to listening to uh, common sense, logic, et cetera, on many of these narratives where the lies were just too, too big, but yet the, the average person still didn't question because, you know, it doesn't affect me. I've got a 401k, I'm good. But once right. the people, once it hits them directly, then you're gonna have some minds that are are much more open and much more angry. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you were talking a minute ago, Bill, about the uh, the deep state and the you know the Rothschilds and all that trying to you know because they know they're running out of time and their their backs against the wall. They might create you know false flag events. Do you think uh, that would include things like civil unrest or martial law in the mix? Well, those would be civil unrest and martial law would be the result. The I mean, there's a hundred. There's probably there's thousands of potential false flags. Who knows? Mm. I mean, we could have another a man-made pandemic. You could see a city somewhere in the world, somewhere in the United States, nuked and blamed on mm. someone. I mean, who knows? Yeah. There's there's so many potential false flags out there. And I'm sure I've not even thought of it because my mind is not, you know, I, I don't think that way. I'm not that devious. Right. Um, so whatever it is, whatever, whatever it turns out to be, is going to be a surprise to the vast, vast majority. Hmm. Something that could not happen. Yeah, like the original lockdowns that people thought were inconceivable, and there we sat. So, um, right. A couple of quick more questions for you, Bill, just to respect your time. I saw something that really struck my attention. I was curious to get your your take on it. Just got it this week. I'm reading this off of. Um, Genevieve Rush on, on X. Apparently, Bank of America is reporting the U.S. debt rises one trillion in the last hundred days. Uh, the U.S. national debt is rising one trillion every hundred days, according to Bank of America. And they estimate it'll take 95 days for the debt to climb to 35 trillion. And we've discussed that we think that number could be much higher, but what they're reporting. Um, what does that say to you in terms of obviously the wheels coming off, the rate of inflation, and now that the banks are finally being forced to admit something is going wrong. Well, first off, the numbers are much, much higher. And I forget uh, yeah. who came out with the numbers. Um, if you take just Social Security and uh, it's either Medicare or Medicaid, I forget. 
mm-hmm. um, th- that they're underfunded by $175 trillion. So, you know, the number of 34 trillion or 35 trillion, that's not even the big story. The big story is all the, all the guarantees, you know, don't forget Ginny Mae, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, et cetera, all the loan guarantees that the government has out there. I mean, it's way over 200 trillion. And yeah, yeah I mean, the, 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 every hundred days, if, if they're piling up another trillion dollars in debt, there's your math right there. That's the other side of what we talked about last time, where the amount of interest service, debt service, uh, is a trillion dollars a year. I mean, mathematically, I mean, you're talking, you're talking about an economy that's what, 27 trillion in size. And there's all kinds of fluff in that. And don't forget, this is a service economy. It's not a, re- it's not an industrial economy any longer where we produce things and export them. We're running a half a trillion a year plus, 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 uh, just on the trade deficit. So, I mean, we're a country that we we have financialized. We're not making stuff anymore. And, you know, we're, we're, we're exporting dollars and we're importing real goods and that's not going to last. And that's one of the reasons that's one of the reasons right there, or one of the big, biggest reasons for the bricks themselves. They're tired of producing real goods, shipping it to the United States and getting dollars in return. It's something right. for nothing. It goes under, I mean, I, I termed it the uh, never pay model. Hmm. Interesting. When, and I, yeah, because I was going to say, you said last time we talked about the BRICS nations, one of the biggest things that they contribute is the de dollarization, something real for something real, like you're talking about with Russia. When do you, on the backs of that bill, when, do, when would you suspect or surmise that that dollar dump, is it already coming back or, or we, we're just the beginning stage is going to get a lot worse? How do, how do you see that playing out? Well, it's, it's like, uh, who was it? Um, Hemingway said how we went broke slowly at first and then all of a sudden mm. I mean, we're we're well into the slowly at first part and i you know whether i'm right or wrong it doesn't matter but i still believe we're going to wake up on a monday morning and find out boom it's over yeah and that'll be the all the you know all of a sudden part yeah yeah makes makes sense um last question for today bill is um if you'd be willing can you give us kind of a brief history Going back to the Federal Reserve, um, you know, Woodrow Wilson creation of the U.S. Central Bank, Bretton Woods, to where Nixon t- took us off to the gold standard, to now, kind of like, kind of summarize, you know, how we got to this point and, um, and how you see us getting out of it, basically. Well, we got to this point, uh, and I would urge everybody that if you've not read it, read the book by uh, G. Edward Griffin, the, the creature from Jekyll Island. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that was about the creation of the Federal Reserve, and the idea behind that was basically uh, to get the United States indebted, get the world indebted to levels that are unsustainable, then raise rates and you blow it up. And we've already gotten to the point where they've raised rates, um, but. The, the point I'm trying to make is it was a plan to begin with. This is a hundred year plan. This is not, uh, you know, this is not some people getting together and then saying, you know, next week or next month or next year, we're going to do something. This was a, this was a long, you know, a, a century plan. And you, I mean, you have to, you have to look at the initially Initially, gold and dollars were interchangeable. And I guess going from first gear to second gear in the plan was when they demonetized gold. And going from second gear to third gear is when Nixon went off the gold standard. And and the dollar became totally fiat. Since 1971, they've been able to print as much money and, and borrow as much money as as they wanted without being uh, restrained or constrained by gold holdings, 
So it was a long-term plan. Um, going off the gold standard, I'm sure, was part of the original plan because under a gold standard, where we are today could never have happened because you you would you'd have governments that would not have been able to borrow as much as they borrowed. You wouldn't have had governments with the ability to do what they did in 2008, 2009, where central banks flooded the system with, with uh, currency and credit and sovereign treasuries borrowed to the point of blowing up their, their balance sheets. That would not have been able to, to happen if gold backed the currencies, even on a ratio basis, because gold was a finite, uh, you know, it's a finite asset. It's a finite money. The mm. supply only grows, what, half percent per year. There's no way you could have debt growth of 7, 8, 9, 10% per year if the money itself was real. So the, the root cause of where we are today is the fact that they went off the gold standards worldwide. Uh, and you had many nations liquidate. I mean, Canada liquidated almost all of their gold. Britain liquidated six, uh, 60% of their gold hmm. back in 1999. You would not have had, you, none of these central banks and none of these sovereign treasuries would have had the ability to do what they've done over the last 20, 30 years if we were on a gold standard. Now, I guess the second part of your question is, you know, how do we get out of it? The only way to get out of it is to have currencies that are real backed by something, whether it be gold, whether it be oil, uh, whether, a, you know, a currency of a, a country that produces wheat, rice, et cetera, you know, they could back currencies with that. I mean, it's not as, nothing is better than gold because gold checks off all the boxes because gold is money itself, but mm. at least you'd have currencies that are, are somewhat real and you know you can trade and, and have some type of confidence that you're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and the currency be gone because uh, the currency is man-made, it's backed by nothing, and, and the government itself collapsed. So that's the way out is go back, go back to basics, go back to currencies that are actually real or connected to something that's real. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Well, uh, great, Bill. As always, an honor to have you. Um, we'll give you the last word as usual. Where can people find your work and contact you and any parting thoughts? Yeah, you can go to my website, uh, bholter.com. You can subscribe to it. Um, I probably put, oh, I don't know, two or three posts up a day. And whenever I post, that goes out to the, the subscribers. Um, that's billholter.com. Very easy to remember. Uh, there is a contact button on the website if you want to contact me directly, if you want to do precious metals business or whatever, um, or you, if you want to contact me uh, directly on my business email. It, it has changed recently. It is, it's now bholter at proton.me. Great. Well, thank you, Bill, for that. As always, we appreciate your time and expertise. We um, look forward to having you on once again in the near future and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Same to you.